Welcome back, my friends, as we come into the New Testament book of Ephesians and continue our study, learning to live out Christ in our daily life. Now, what are the attitudes that the world most prizes? Is it not things like self-actualization, a certain level of independence, the ability perhaps even to pull oneself up by one's own bootstraps, even a certain degree of pride in one's own abilities and achievements? And yet, what are the character qualities that God most prizes? We're going to be looking at that today in chapter 4. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this time. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray that wherever they're at, whether at the lunch table right now or later on in the evening or whenever they see this video, may they be encouraged from your word. To my friends, wherever they're listening from, I pray that you would grant them grace and strength that they would come to a deeper understanding or maybe a first understanding of who Jesus is and what you've done for them, O Christ, on the cross. We ask your blessing upon this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1 through 3, Paul lays out what we've been given in Christ, and it is glorious. Matter of fact, I, I challenge you. Take the time throughout the week to review Ephesians 1 through 3. Even underline those things that have been expressly given to us because of Christ's work on the cross. Ephesians chapter 4 through 6 then describes the life we are to live because of what Christ has given us. In other words, we have been made spiritual royalty in Christ, been given God himself, and to reflect that great glory, we are called to live in a certain way. There are standards in the military, perhaps if you join the Marines or certain branches, no matter where you are in the world, there are, there are codes of conduct that if you're going to be a part of this elite or select group, that you're to act and conduct yourself in a certain way. Well, in the Christian life, because we have been called by Christ and we bear his name, literally the royalty of God himself in our being because of Jesus' work on the cross, we are likewise called to live in a way that reflects that glory, reflects his character. Now, we said the world prizes a certain set of character qualities in, in people, but what is it that God prizes most? We're actually given that here in chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, where Paul says, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all, listen to it, humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So we have four things that are given here. Humility, gentleness, patience, and then bearing up with one another in love. Now let's tackle the first one here, and then let's look at some helpful ways for how to live this out. The first one is this, humility. Now humility is found throughout Scripture. This is not just something that we see in the book of Ephesians. Do you remember in the end of Isaiah, in chapter 63, it actually says, uh, This is the man to whom I will look. One who is humble, contrite, and trembles at my word. Uh, Peter, in the book that bears his name in the New Testament, urges Christians to walk in in humility. Uh, Paul himself, in the book of Philippians chapter 2, tells us to, to have the same attitude that Christ had, that attitude of humility. I don't know if there are a few there are many more things that are that are destructive as much as pride and arrogance. Um, even in a sense of attractiveness, uh, if you're looking for a future mate, pride and arrogance are not something that that wins the heart. Rather, it is a humility, a sense of one's own placement uh, before God. Now, this also reflects Jesus' own teaching in Matthew 5, verse 3, the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who recognize that they need God. You see, the world says, recognize who you are. But the Bible says, recognize who God is and understand your place and your position in relation to him. And the more that you see God, the more that you understand what you've been given, the more it humbles us and actually gives birth to true worship. So how do we learn humility? It isn't something that we can fabricate. It's not something you can wake up and say, I'm going to be humble today. No. The way that you humble yourself or live in humility is every single day 
with an open heart, pray, get into God's word and revel in who God is and understand what he has given you so that your heart is brought into subjection and awed by God. Only a big view of God, only a big view of what he has done for us truly gives us biblical humility. Humility, and then the second one, gentleness. Now this is a gentleness that is not weakness, but rather it is the gentleness of a tempered spirit. Someone whose life is, is, has been tenderized by grace. Interestingly enough, this progression that Paul gives here in Ephesians 4 very much reflects Jesus' progression in Matthew uh, 5 with the Beatitudes. Uh, the first one, blessed are the poor in spirit, and then blessed are those who mourn, and blessed are the meek. And that progression that once you realize who you are before God, it, it tenderizes our heart and it teaches us to be gentle with other sinners, with other people, because we know from what we have been saved. In other words, confrontation with God and with grace makes us realize, who am I? I am simply a sinner saved by grace. And it teaches me to be gentle with others as God has been gentle with me. So humility produces a gentleness. Now, how do we cultivate gentleness and kindness? Again, it is by spending time with our Lord. It is, it is by monitoring our own, our own actions and behavior. Am I being gentle with others as I would like God to be gentle with me? I thank God that he is gentle with me because I am a difficult person. By the way, just like you are, we're sinners. We struggle with our sin. And God is so kind, so gentle with us. And likewise, we should be gentle and kind with others, with your spouse, with your children, with your friends, uh, no matter who they are. Driving down the road when someone cuts you off or when you're trying to get through the grocery store and come home on time, be gentle. Don't you know that it's God's kindness and his gentleness that leads us to repentance? Well, likewise, to walk in a manner worthy of what God has called us to, we're to reflect Christ and be gentle even as he has been gentle with us. I think that one of the greatest marks of a mature believer is not how much they know, but actually the kindness and the gentleness that exudes from their behavior. It is the life that has been broken, that has been tenderized by grace. It is the life that is gentle to the touch. Now, the third thing that Paul mentions here is patience. And again, thank God for his patience with us. And yet, let's be honest, it is so hard to have patience. You know, we wake up, either on the wrong side of the bed, or maybe someone is legitimately difficult, and it's been a hard day. How do you be patient, moms, when your kids during this quarantine are running around like crazy? Well, first of all, just like the first two, you need to recognize this is not something that you can just fabricate on your own. Patience is something that has to be sought for from God himself. Jesus, please help me to have patience. Now, the patience, the word that is used here is the Greek word macrothumia. Uh, now, thumos means anger or rage. But that macro at the beginning of the word has the, makes it that, that, that you're to be slow to rage, slow to anger. You know how many times in the Old Testament God has described long-suffering, the God who is slow to anger. And that's the word that is used here. It's not just a generic patience, but it takes a lot to get you riled up. It takes a lot to get you from calmness to anger anger or to frustration. And there's steps in there. Perhaps we start off with, okay, I'm, I'm in a state of um, complete calmness, and then I'm irritated. Now I'm frustrated. Now I'm mad, and then angry, and then in a full-blown rage. Again, I would encourage you, how long does it take you to move along that spectrum? Because yet this is another mark of describing our even own walk with Jesus and our own spiritual maturity. Do we go from immediate um, calmness to anger or rage? Well, let me, let me give you some hope. First of all, all of us have those moments that it just feels like we can be lit off at any moment. The big thing is that when it happens, you are quick 
to seek God's forgiveness and the forgiveness of those around you. When you get frustrated or angry, have the humility and the gentleness to say, hey kids, daddy did not act in a way that represented Jesus well. Or to your spouse and say, I am sorry. I got angry and frustrated. Or to your friends or to maybe you even need to go back to the cashier from the day before at Kroger and say, you may not remember me. I'm so sorry for being impatient. Demonstrate that humility. Seek after that gentleness and strive for patience. And then ask God for help. Humility, notice as the first thing, is is the precursor to everything that is going to come in chapter 4 through 6. And what is one of the greatest demonstrations of humility? Prayer. Uh, Praying to God, recognizing that you don't have enough faculties or energies or abilities to do all these things on your own. And so in humility, you come to God in prayer and you say, God, help me. You have made me a child of God, Ephesians 1 through 3. Now help me to live out that which Christ has made me to be. You see, in chapter 3, it says that Christ, in verse 17, that Christ dwells in our hearts through faith. And since Christ is resident within us, that he has given us the power to live out these things, but we have to seek him for help. You see, Christ is here through his Holy Spirit. But are you seeking him? Are you pursuing him through prayer? Are you asking for his help even today? Humility, gentleness, patience, slow to anger. And then it says, bearing with one another in love. Specifically, uh, the idea here, if you would interpret it literally, is, is to put up with one another. <laughs> uh, now, now we can say, I'm, I'm just putting up with that person because they're difficult. You know what? They really may be. But here is the defining um, caveat. You're to put up with one another in love. Interestingly enough, the way that it's translated, to put up with one another, recognizes the fact that interactions with other people are not easy. I am difficult in my flesh, and you are difficult in your flesh. Thank God that he puts up with me, he puts up with you, and likewise we are called to put up with each other. But not just to tolerate each other, but to put up with each other, to bear with one another, to stand with one another, to even with those people that grate against us in love. That is how we're to approach them. Not with a begrudging, oh, I can't stand them and I'm going to get through this day, but rather praying that God would fill you with love that surpasses your own faculties and abilities and flows directly from his Holy Spirit. And again, where does this come from? By seeking him in prayer, by being in his word, and by being cognizant of your own actions. And then when you make mistakes, have the humility and the gentleness and even the patience with them and with yourself to say, I'm sorry, and to resolve in Christ, in the power of his spirit, to work on those actions. So we're to put up with one another. We're to to love one another. Why? Not because we are lovable inherently, but rather because Jesus first loved us. He loved you. He loved me. And because of the way Jesus has loved us, we are called also to love others. Now, there's another characteristic here, and it says, so I gave you four. Now, this is number five, but we're only going to do four today, so don't worry. It says, eager, verse three, to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So humility, gentleness, patience, putting up with one another is for a purpose of maintaining unity in the Spirit. Now, what does it mean to have unity in the spirit. This is not just simply that we all get along. This has significant theological underpinnings that reflects the Holy Trinity itself. That when we act out and when we live out these characteristics, that we are bringing glory to God and picturing him in a mighty way to each other and to the world around us. But we're going to look at that next time. So next Tuesday at noon, 
Come back, join with me here, and let's understand these next few verses of what it means to have unity in the Spirit and why humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love is so critical in demonstrating who Christ is and what he has done for us. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for this day. For my brothers and sisters in Christ, I pray for strength in what you have given them. You dwell in them, with them, through the power of your Spirit. And Lord, help them. Break pride. Uh, Teach them patience and gentleness to put up with one another in love. And Lord, I pray that for myself as well. Oh, how much I need you on a daily basis. Father, for my friends who are listening in, uh, whatever has drawn them here, I pray that if they have any questions about who you are, that they would seek us out. I pray that they would find and seek and see a God who loves them. These are things that we cannot do in and of ourselves, O God. We are utterly dependent upon you, Jesus, and your Holy Spirit working in and through us. Give us strength this day to walk worthy of the calling that you've called us to. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining me today. And I pray that you will strive to live out Christ even right now as you sign off at work or at home. Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. I know this is a challenging time during quarantine and being away from everybody. There is a ministry partner here locally, Hill City Counseling, and they are just a, a beloved partner, David and Suzanne Mickelson, who uh, head up that organization. If you have any questions, you can call them directly. You can Google Hill City Counseling, and you can find them online. Or you can call the church office, and we'll be glad to supply you with details, phone numbers, and even um, uh, ways in which you can uh, get counseling services and encouragement from them. Likewise, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to call the office. And our pastors, of course, are always here as well to help, encourage, pray for you, and offer guidance uh, through his word. Have a blessed day, and may we walk in a manner worthy today of Christ.